dying to bring you the news. It's the New Eden Times News Network. I'm No Style Fred, and this week I spoke with Hell's Hitman, a garista pilot in Esoteria. Welcome to the show. Please introduce yourself. All right, so my name's Hell's Hitman. I am the former CEO, CEO Emeritus of uh, No Mercy. We've been around for over 14 years. We've taken part in almost every major escapade there has been in EVE for most of the last 14 years. And now we're uh, hiatus down in Esoteria. I'm up here running operations in uh, the insurgency zones with uh, Garistas, having a good time. Pretty much split my time between uh, going down to Nullsec, uh, down with the Alliance in Esoteria. Um, as a member of the Imperium and being up here in Garista's insurgencies, uh, just running them as best we can, trying to get coordination, fleet out for people. I have people that don't like me. I have people that like me, but I don't really have anybody that I don't like. Uh, so one of the one of those situations, pretty much like everybody, even if they're the yeah, Oxyrix, even if you know, they're not very savory people. I still like them. They're still part of the experience. I'm pretty much always recruiting, but I tend to kill the people before I recruit them. Normally, for most of my recruits, they've been people that I've caught out doing something silly. I've killed them, talked to them about it, and I was like, man, this guy can really take it on the chin. All right, he's got potential. You know, hey, why don't you come over here, fly with me? We kill the next guy, we recruit him too. That's normally how I recruit. If there's somebody who has the willingness to fight, if you're willing to lose 30, 40 ships just for a good time and you don't really care about kill boards, things like, like that, that's that's where it comes in for me. I just need people that I know if I say, hey, there's a fight here, you're going to show up and fight. And you're gonna trust me to be able to replace your ship or help you out, get a new ship, because we're all on it for the same thing. We're all on it for the content. And I'm stronger when you've got a ship to fly. So I'm going to help you fix your ship and get a new one out there. New bros have always been my passion. Like, I love watching a new person experience EVE. It's fantastic. Being able to give somebody their first shiny ship. Taking them out on their first PvP room. Watching them get blown up for the first time. And just hearing the nerves in their voice and how excited they get. That is peak eve experience for me because i get to watch these people go through and enjoy the same things that got me hooked on eve you know 15 20 years ago and i get to watch them in real time just get into it now and now i have the is that i can just throw them that shit they've been dreaming about be like look man you finished training for it and it's sitting here for you you just have to keep playing long enough to finish your training and those players usually won't quit because they've got that ship right there in front of them that they can reach out and grab as soon as they finish training for it. I love it. So most days I'm just sitting here working my nine to five, turn around, watch what's going on. Somebody needs help or fight in between calls, but I'm driving content for other people. Tell me more about the insurgency. So out here is, this is, uh, Insurgency space. So insurgency space can spread through both high sec and low sec. Um, you'll see plexus if you look at your overview. You'll see like Arista's open or Arista's large. Um, those are the plexus we run. Basically, you go inside the plex. If you're a neutral, you'll go suspect. Anybody inside can engage you. Um, orbit the point, kill the NPCs. 15 minutes or so, get the LP. Um, Pretty quick, pretty basic. And then you get the more advanced plexes that spawn, which are called mining ops and uh, ice refineries. Ice refineries being the 30-man uh, battlefield type uh, activity that they have for insurgencies. Um, so each side would spawn on their own different uh, part of the battlefield. And then neutrals would spawn in the middle. And the objective is to get tankers, run them to the score point. You score 10, you win. All while massive waves of enemies are spawning in on you. Mining up, you're defending, or you're either defending or destroying a yeah, Rorqual. Uh, basically just killing the waves of enemies until the Rorqual pays up, and then you leave. But though that grants you either suppression or corruption. Um, if you have the insurgencies on your, basically your side view on your screen, you should be able to see an insurgency drop down. And if you hover over the corruption number there, it'll show you 
the benefits uh, from each side that are currently in effect for the system. The oh. most notable ones at uh, Corruption 5 when the system goes lawless. So you can use bubbles and low sec. You can do, uh, basically, you can hit any new you want to in, uh, in high sec. So Concord doesn't show up in high sec. Bubbles are available in low sec. Our main problem with these insurgencies has just been getting, just been really getting people organized, getting people into, uh, getting people actually into the game. We have a lot of, we're basically split into two people with not many people in the middle. We either have the new bros who are here, you know, they've spent their whole lives in high sec. They're here simply to, simply to experience some combat, some PVP and something new for the first time. And then we have a lot of real old school players who have just been playing forever. And this is just an income source to them. So trying to get everybody on the same page and get the lower guys skilled up, get the bigger guys to care about more than their wallets, has been a little bit difficult. But we've got some really good personalities, so it's slow starting. We've done some good work. I mean, that campaign over in Uzi, we've got we we cleared out that guy's thirty-one set of Athenors. So can't really be too sad about it. We got some Rytaris and Tatara kills for pretty much a fractured group of quite a few new bros and some old hats that's not a bad result the insurgencies are ran in sets so this insurgency is the only garista's insurgency open right now when this insurgency ends so in this case we either have to hit i believe it's 12 systems you see yeah 12 systems so we either have to hit 12 systems uh have to hit seven and then destroy our forward operating base once either of those objective, objectives are met, we uh, enter into a cooldown period. 24 hours after that, a new FOB, will, a new forward operating base will appear. Um, switching between Kaldari and Galente space usually. Sometimes we'll get Kaldari or Galente back to back, but usually it rotates fairly evenly. Um, and that'll be the new insurgency area. So we'll get systems that'll spawn at a temperate system inside the insert. Get an initial set of five systems, and that is every time we get a system up to Corruption 3, it spreads out one system further. So our goal for insurgencies like this is to pick a target and try to get it pushing in whatever direction we think is going to give us the most content, usually. So sometimes we we land incredibly close to high sec, so we just put all of our resources on putting pushing that high sec uh, corridor as far as we can. Um, while the farmers and such usually stay back in low sec and just farm. Just to see what kind of content we can scare up, see what kind of kind of fun we can have, how much havoc we can cause into the system. This is the end of the day. We're pirates. What pirates do. How do corruption mechanics benefit pirates like yourself? We looked in Uzi and, and there was there was thirty plus Athenors ran by a single guy and then a bunch of other pictures in there. If we didn't destroy it, nobody else was ever going to. Guys had them for three plus years. So nobody else. This is These are opportunities to get kills that nobody else would get outside of maybe a war deck. For us, that's something, you know, that's, that's content. That's unique content, and that's valuable content. So that's what we typically would go for is something that we couldn't usually get. The corruption mechanics allow us to expand our range of targets. So in our mind, we should probably use them as, you know, given to us. Well, we've had some complaints about, you know, hitting the targets in high sec, but a lot of the things we hit, we hit a ton of uh, bosses that were just sitting there unpowered, unfueled, nothing going on, but we took them out. That was most of the targets we killed, and then we had killed those citadels. Occasionally, we'll get a ratter that ignored the, uh, the warning that they're about to enter a Corruption 5 system. We've got quite a few Tangus and Golems and such like that every time we get a, a high set corrupted. But that's like anywhere else in if you didn't read the warnings, so you paid the tax. I paid that tax multiple times in my EVE career. It's more putting people at, putting people at risk that normally wouldn't be at risk. And we can only spread to 0.7 systems and below. We can't spread to 0.8s, we can't spread to 0.9s, we can't spread to 1.0s. So there's a vast amount of high sec that is still well without, a, with, you know, outside of our reach. We can hit some of the trade routes between Amar and Jitta, some of the uh, ancillary trade routes we can compromise, but only if we get a perfect position on the insurgency and push it in that direction in an organized fashion, which we are anything but organized most days. 
What the heck is that? This is basically the base that pops up in the center of every insurgency. So this tells us, this is basically the uh, headquarters of the insurgency. This is what the enemy has to kill in order to take down the insurgency. Because it's a Grista's pirate fob and you have to manually add it to your overview in order for it to show up. Because it's a new asset, so it might not pop up there naturally. After they suppress seven systems, they have to destroy this uh, structure right here. So there's going to be two, re they have a 24 hour timer before they can attack it, and then one 24 hour timer, and then death. And if they destroy it, they win. Meanwhile, we're trying to just corrupt as many systems as possible. So they've got an additional, uh, basically a win condition that we don't have. So the ship caster that's in Zarzak also links back to this structure. So if you're a member of the Garissa's militia, you can uh, use the ship caster to drop right down there where you see the uh, basically the red points of light converging. That's the uh, that's where the ship caster would drop you off at. It sends you one way, it sends you here, but it will not send you home, which is one thing that most people malicious think that uh, CCP should probably update because not having it be a two-way ship caster really is terrible. Because if you leave your assets in the FOB and we win, the FOB disappears and all your assets go into asset safety. So something with that process needs to be fixed because it doesn't really feel too much like a forward operating base and people have started kind of avoiding it in lieu of the stations and system. Because at least if they use the stations and system, their stuff's not going to get tossed into asset safety. Um, if CCP can actually get those mechanics right in a way that's comfortable for people but doesn't you know, make it too easy to move their stuff, I think that'll be a huge, huge benefit for the system. That's the biggest thing about this game, man. The love and the care that's put into it is unlike anything else. This is somebody who made 15 designs of the same basic building and then chose the one that he liked the best because it was his personal project. And I adore that. Could you please tell me about your goals related to the attacks on popular trade routes? When it comes to really taking down those trade routes, our goals are going to be to push for those trade routes for obvious reasons. Um, first off, as a militia that struggles being underpopulated, we want to make an impact. We want to have a splash. We want to show people we can get stuff done and entice people to join us. Um, hitting the trade routes is a very easy way to, to make an impact. Second off, there's a ton of assets. There are every single time that we push into an high, a high sec area, we get all sorts of marauders. We've gotten some freighters, blinged out tangus who just ignore the insurgency warning and jump into that system. So there's tons of good kills, tons of loot that loot to have, especially when you're in these insurgency areas and PVP drop rates are increased. You're killing a four build uh, marauder that would normally drop you maybe a bill. Instead, in the insurgency area, it drops you two. So you get plenty of profit out of it. So we're most likely going to keep pushing the uh, high sec areas. I'd like to. I think there's a ton of old structures that, that could be cleared out. Um, so once we hit Corruption 5 in a system, what I'd like to do is run through with a bunch of people, shout out the old posses, uh, any of the old structures that are dead not being used as a part of a way to kind of decrease CCP's server leg a little bit. Get rid of some of the old assets. For the larger structures, like, like the uh, uh, Tranquility Trading, um, structures that were up near perimeter and such. Those were all grandfathered in because you can't do uh, XL structures um, up there that were there. I believe it was a keep star and then uh, I forget the one that just went down the other day. Uh, those ones were grandfathered in, fathered in. A lot of the ones that we fight tend to be in the low sex space, um, low high sex. So between 0.7 and 0.5 where the insurgencies can actually run. So most of those ones aren't really grandfathered there. What are some of your goals as a pirate? That's the environment that I'm trying to push out in the Garista's uh, militia. Is a bunch of people that just have each other's back, not because we expect to have anything back, just because we want the experience to be good for everybody. We're pirates. We obviously want to recruit as many pirates as we can. And if I'm giving you a ship to go kill somebody with, I feel like that's a pretty piratey thing to do. If I'm creating pirates by giving out free ships that I've, in effect, funded with structures I've killed from the militias and ships I've killed from the militias, that's pretty piratey. It's nice, it's in good faith, and it's also fairly piratey. 
biggest pushback is people say that you're not mean enough. You're not enough of a pirate. Well, pirates can be good people, too. We just don't like authority. Don't like the boots on our necks. No taxes, no fees. But, like, my corp really made a name for itself when it came to the uh, the Hero Coalition when we had when we were ta- helping Brave take catch. Um, way back in the day before Brave had even taken soft. And my corp was the one, like, uh, Zax Tanner, who was my second in command at the time, he ended up actually in charge of Hero Coalition for the most part. Alongside the leadership of Brave, he was chosen as basically the nonpartisan, you know, not one of the major alliance leaders represented to be in charge of Hero Coalition. So we broke down the doors on a lot of the systems because Brave was filled with newbies to the core. A lot of those guys, they didn't want to go into NullSec because they were scared. They were paranoid. It wasn't until watching us kind of break down the doors for the first week, two weeks, three weeks, and they started seeing how much fun we were having and listening into our comms, getting invited on it, that they really started getting that impetus to leave the low sex system and go down. And ever since then, Brave's been on a tear from what I've been able to catch back up on. Brave's been doing fantastic. But back when we were down in, uh, back when we were down in catch, you know, I was dodging PL fleets. And, you know, some of these Brave guys, as their first PvP action was, you know, a, like a, a PL Super Cat fleet dropping on their heads. And Hurley, if you're out there somewhere, listen to this, buddy. Oh, we got you good. We had we had some good times down to catch playing around with the PL pilots. They were a really good, really high skill bunch of guys, and everything we could not to get completely wiped by them every single time. There were times we had super carriers that we had our we got our first super carrier. We're taking it out to go kill some. Uh, I think it was iHubs or SVUs at the time, and uh, PL drops. We get the super carrier cloaked up. They come within about five kilometers of that super carrier, and we are all sitting there collectively just shitting bricks. <laughs> we're like, oh no, 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 we're gonna lose this, and they never caught it. We got that thing out of there without dying, and the entire night was laughing to death over how close we came to losing it and didn't. No, that's it. That's that's the specialness. That's what they need. Like, I'll do just about anything I have to to have a more successful game because it's provided a lot to me. It's provided a lot of life lessons. Once you understand how e-politics works, it makes real-life politics get a lot easier to understand. Same dynamic. Once you actually get involved in the leadership of these big alliances and you see how they run, and then you get involved in your local politics, you'll realize that they are one and the same. They operate the exact same way, the same amount of corruption, been bad. all that stuff's still happening. But I was actually involved in a way, way more involved in e-politics. That's the only thing that has me interested in kind of e-politics, cause, or in real life politics. Because when it comes to e-politics, you know, if you really want to have a successful alliance, if you really want to have a successful corporate, you want your members to be making maximum profit, which means you're navigating that corporation trying to make everybody the maximum amount of money and get them the maximum amount of content and that is a very specific balance of finding people to be hostile to without being full-on enemies to so you can keep the like friendly tit for tats going without completely burning your contacts over there so i i've loved loved being a ceo and like managing that dynamic between all the different contacts being a CEO and in Eve's probably been one of the most interesting things I've ever done. Way more challenging than any job I've had, and way more rewarding than any job I've had by far. I can put tasks at work, and I look back at the things I've done on Eve to make it work, especially when we were, like I said, with Hero Coalition, we were running, you know, 3,000, 4,000 people at that time, trying to manage logistics. And then, you know, this you know job puts something in front of me that handles about 15, this is cake. You don't understand, one time we had to get 4,000 people moved across three different regions in at least four days. No extra time given. You want me to do this with 15 people? Oh, that's cake. You get it done. When I decided to, when we we decided to evade catch, we, and, you know, this is a little less diplomatic, but we were just pissed off that nobody was doing anything. So there was like five, ten of us that had dreads and we were like, all right. Well, you know what, if they're not going to go do anything, if none of these fleets are actually going into Null and they're just fighting in low sec, 
We're gonna go start bashing things down. So we bought some SBUs, we went out there, we actually started taking systems. And once we started taking systems, the backlash was crazy. And then we just kept taking them, and eventually, like, all right, well, we're gonna take them too. Started leaving fleets, taking sob, and that's how the whole snowball got rolling. But it wasn't until we were willing to be like, you know what? We're just gonna go do it. And ease a game that gave us the potential to actually just go do it. Like, we were told not to by Alliance leadership, Coalition leadership, as well as our own Alliance leadership. And we we're just like, yeah, you know, we're gonna do it anyways. It needs to be done. This is what we're here for. You guys might be off, but we'd rather get things going. And you can do that every day in EVE. You could decide to just randomly war deck somebody, lay seeds to their stuff, and raise it to the ground or lose horribly. For no reason other than the fact that you decided that's what you were going to do this week. You can make it your goal just to mess with those guys at that bubble camp right there. For a part of those players that were interacted with people in that system, you become part of their history and eat. You become the boogeyman. You become their bad guy. Like, and I've always loved that impact that you can have on Eve. Like, I become people's, like, people message me to this day. Oh, yeah, I remember when we fought with you here. Like, I don't remember this person. I don't even remember the fight. But for that person, that was their favorite fight they ever had. And I was an FC in it. Or, you know, I kicked it all off. And I absolutely adore when people message me be like that because then i'm i'm like wait a second let me pull up those kill mails and i'm reading through the kill mails and i'm remembering all these times i died you know and i'm remembering this exact fight in this person i'm like oh my goodness i remember you now you know you, you went in and you suicided to try to save my dread i love you and like you start actually getting in contact with these people that they were just a random newbie in your fleet you know you had a 30-man fleet and they were just one of the 30 but for them, you were like, you were the dude. You were the guy that they were following into battle. And it's kind of just cool seeing how much of an impact you can have on somebody like that in just through a video game, you know? They give you a lot of respect. They got, they give, people give you a lot of respect. When you actually get in there, you start leading them into battle. Like they will give you their risk. They will give, they, they're putting their risk on the line for you. I'll put it that way. Like, they're taking their income that they worked hard for, that they could be spending on more game time, and they're putting it into a ship, and they're literally telling you, take me somewhere to do something cool. That's a lot of responsibility. All these people putting that their content time, some of these people only get three, four hours of gaming time of, a week, and they're giving that time to you to find them content and hopefully get them a win. That's a lot of a lot of pressure when you actually start understanding what it was. And that's part of why I try to give as much as I do and try to, you know, drive as much content for people. It's like, if you only have a couple hours to play, I want you to be able to do something cool with it. I want you to be able to have some fun. Let me scare up some content for you. Let me go run some mining ops in a carrier to see if I can have something cool happen. I can afford it. Why not? Girmill's not the... Uh... We're not the most organized, we don't have the most people, but we've got some really good people. Yeah. I try to paint us off like we're like we're the bad guys, but at the end of the day, we're just guys trying to enjoy the game, trying to have fun, trying to make sure everybody else is having fun too. Yeah. We really chose the most understaffed militia with the weakest forces and with the worst military position because we are instantly cut off from Jitta and Dodixie. That whole area we can't go to without a uh, Navy ship shooting at us. That's part of the reason why most people don't sign up for us. Because you, you're cutting yourself off of the major trade hub. You know, you pretty much have to have a neutral out at that point or be very resourceful. Well, that's why I love it. Every single every single one of them made a sacrifice. Everybody that joined it with their main, that was a sacrifice for them. How are your relations with the big block alliances? I'll put it this way. I've worked in pretty much every big block alliance. The only one that I hadn't worked in before was uh, Imperium, and I'm now partially sad to be a member of the Imperium because I spent so long being on the opposite side. But I've learned that the Goonie Bros are good guys. All right, most most of them I get along with. The big blocks only tend to be a problem for me when it comes to their leadership and when it comes to actually trying to there, there's too much control on what the average player can do anytime that the players get a hand on it, especially in null. I, there needs to be some sort of a null sec area, some sort of a growing area for uh, groups and alliances that doesn't immediately force them to take sides with one coalition or the other. 
think that's one of the problems that we've had in all and it getting stagnate is that there's not much there's no reason to not be part of a major coalition so if you want to survive as a group as alliance leadership you're pushed to side with one group or the other just to keep your and to make sure they have space and content and i think there needs to be a third option personally the, the same vein as the protection rackets that go in high sec with black flag and such where people can you know you can say how safe high sec is but try to put try to put a structure up somewhere that black like avoid the black flag notices coming to your door stating that you have to pay up or lose your structure you know things stories like that are all too common and it's the same and all but there's no real counterplay to large groups like that if one guy could, if one group can field 100 battleships you can only field 20 you either have to play out of your mind and have those you know 20 players be able and willing to fight every single engagement with nearly unlimited resources or you're gonna fight and there's just not too much not too too much counterplay for smaller groups to be able to overthrow the bigger groups so i would love more conflict i just want to fight a war i just want to go back to war i've been while i did the insurgencies i'm waiting for the whatever war is going to kick off to kick off so i can go and just tear some space up I stopped playing about five years ago. I'm only recently getting back into the game. But back when I played, I was in all sorts of chats between leadership, between alliances that, you know, for public eve appearances were at each other's throat, but their leadership have, you know, public comms together. They arrange the fleets, they whip up the propaganda, they both know it's propaganda, and they get along with each other in face-to-face -face chats with a bunch of other leadership. And basically I, I don't know how it is right now because i'm not involved with the leadership in any of these groups now but it was all basically a big propaganda lie between all the different groups they didn't really hate each other but they knew they had to provide enough content to keep people engaged and make it feel real enough so people felt invested in order to keep their group growing and but if they went for the killing blow they risk ruining that content if you kill your enemy who's left nobody so that n neither group has an incentive to end the other group because at the end of the day, that's their content. That's why their people log in, their people content for fights. And if you take away anybody that can provide content or fights, you're killing the game and you're killing your organization. But that was one thing that got me disillusioned with major NALSEC politics you know, back in the day was just understanding that nobody was actually going for the throat. They were all saying they were going for the throw, talking a big game, but when it came down to it, when the deals needed to be made, they were all too willing to make the deal. And me personally, if I say I'm going to you know, go after somebody, I don't want to be in a position where I'm making a deal with them you know, a week later to you know, save them. I, I want to at least follow through with what I said before I go back to being on friendly terms. So that frustrated me. Having people, oh yeah, these are our enemies. Get all formed up. You're ready to take out your enemies. And you see the deals being made behind the scenes, and it leaves you with that queasy, oily feeling. Like you just wasted your time for somebody else's uh, sick enjoyment. But it's part of the game, you know, that drama has to keep going. That's what I had to, I had to learn during my off time, is that just because, you know, it's a little bit duplicitous, in the end, these people are aiming, for the most part, to have as much content for their members as possible. And part of that includes not killing all of the enemies, no matter how much you might want to. Todd, you gotta live so, live, let them live so they can fight you again tomorrow. There wouldn't be enough counterplay. So having these groups that can comfortably go to war with each other without total leaders, so people still have stability, but they also have the content. And the server, EVE as a whole, needs war. It, there needs to be consistent conflict for EVE to work. If people aren't losing ships, people won't need to make ships. Prices will tank, et cetera, et cetera. Oversupply. The whole system doesn't work if people aren't dying. So, you know, love or hate PvP, people need the game to be successful. So we need the wars, we need the large-scale conflict, but we also need to kind of preserve the communities and the stability while doing it. And I think we found a decent balance, but far from a good balance. It, it comes down to the point that the players have to do it. You know, it has to be a player. Any movement to basically establish more or less of a safe zone more or less of a way that people could actually grow as their corporations and alliances without having to fold into the major coalitions would have to be agreed to by the major coalitions you know because 
the major coalition would take the region if they wanted at any point in time. There's really no no stopping people who have had NullSec for 15 plus years all that time to build up their Titans, build up their Super Cat fleets. And kind of a joke how many Super Caps and Titans are flying around right now. You know, people joke about it, they kid about it, but it's true. So, you know, any small alliance, this isn't going to hope to stand against them naturally. It has to be player driven to give them that window to grow. And I just don't the major coalitions really have it in them to give those players that much room. But I think if they do, it'll be in that positive for Eve. It'll drive more players. It'll allow smaller groups to flourish. And the smaller groups and the new bros are what you're really looking at because they'll bring in friends. All have already heard about Eve for years. Most of them aren't going to randomly pick up the game. But someone that's just getting in, they find a good community, they find a good corp, maybe they get out to, you know, some sort of a null sec with a nice group that they love flying with, don't have to fold into any of the major groups, just allowed to live peacefully, they'll bring in their friends. You know? Those friends will have never touched Eve and possibly have, you know, five or six other friends who have never touched Eve. That's how the game stays alive. That's how the game grows even after 15 plus years of operating, you know? That's how everything keeps keeps alive. But it feels like we're shutting down those opportunities and we're forcing people to give away their social identities to kind of identify as either Imperium, Panda Fam. You know, you have to identify as these people can't really identify as your own solo group as much. You step back just a little bit for the health of the game. We do have consumer protection, business protection that at least leg up. We give you that room to get anywhere close to Amazon, but you can at least give it a running start in the real world, you know? There, we need to have a way for people to actually give it a running start, you know? At some point, they're going to become a threat. The big groups are either going to stop them out or lose to them. But it gives that breeding ground for talent and that breeding ground to shake things up. And without chaos becomes entropy. So if we don't have some form of chaos in the system, the system stabilizes, quickly flips into entropy, and then... We're in a decaying, shrinking game that's dying. So I'd rather have as many you know, new bros coming in, old players coming back, but which requires that conflict, which requires that growth. And the players in high sec, for the most part, the ones that I've met, they they literally just, they're as idealistic as they come. They're like, oh, eventually I want to have this huge empire. And they're, they're dreaming all these things. And you're like, man, this is what you do. You know what? That's this guy's goal. That's what this guy is chasing. I want every single person with that kind of idealistic mindset to be able to touch whatever part of the game they can. Because those are the people that are going to make things happen that everybody else thought was impossible. That's going to drive eyes on the game, funding to the game, players to the game. And I disagree with any barriers to access for these players. I just don't see the value in them. Yeah, it makes one coalition or another money, but it costs the game as a whole. So it's a detriment to more than it's a positive for it. The main thing to remember is to try not to hate any group at all of the game, because there's really not a point. They're eventually going to be your allies. That's how EVE works. The sides routinely flip back and forth. You're going to end up on one side or the other for a period, probably on the other side for a period of time. So there's really no use hating either of them. Just look at them as people looking for content and have fun with it. If they kill you, that's just a bunch of guys sitting at their computer just talking crap on their looking for someone to kill. All right. I lean into it. I'll build up another ship, see if I can get past you this time. The number one thing I see people do, though, is they get killed by someone and they just get so salty about it. What drawback is there to being an outlaw? That's the angel of null sector dilemma. You get up to fucking high sec where you're supposed to be safe and you're just like, man, this feels so dangerous. <laughs> I do not feel comfortable at all in high sec anymore. Spend a nice long fucking enjoy down the fucking all sec. You just you lose it. I sec just stops feeling safe. Man, I got I got six hundred and seventy six people in local right now, and half of them probably want me dead. Yeah, hunting the uh, hunting the ratters and the uh, high sec mission runners is fun when the insurgencies are up there, but it does generate a lot of kill rates. I had to repair my sex status. I'm like perpetually balancing my uh, sex status out. I refuse to pay for it because I'm stubborn, so I always end up just traveling to Null and running belts for a couple days. That's it. You get the one level up, the insurgency ends, you're like, alright, time to bail down to Null, I'll just grind out some rats. 
by the insurgency opens up and really gets kicked off, my sex status is back to positive. I'm good to go. Yeah, if I'm with Sovnol, you know, those couple days or two days worth of ratting can sometimes net me five, six billion. So it's good is to come back to, and the insurgencies are great isk. How do you feel about losing your expensive ships? If you do, do PvP on this game and you're not a blob or you're not someone that runs with heavy E war, you know, crazy amounts of stuff, you're going to die. You're going to lose your ships no matter what. And that's just going to happen. There's no way around it. So when someone else loses their ship to you, it's kind of easy to be like, all right, you know, bro, I was in that same position last week. The same kind of engagement. Yeah, I, and that's that's the thing that Eve that's the thing Eve was for the longest time though. Eve was, you know, hey, it, it sucks to lose. That's why I fly expensive stuff because I like that rush of lo losing a ship. I love losing ships. If I didn't lose a ship, I probably wouldn't play Eve. And for me, Eve, you get to make your own story. You know, you get to make your own choices as far as where you're going. And there's no other game that offers that to you. For me, I hop in the Leshak that I just lost that's over a billion isk. I jump into a fight against 15 people and I lose horribly, but I kill three people while I'm at it. For me, that's worth it. I don't care about how the kill board looks after. I killed three people, 15 people got content because I was willing to spend the billion isk. That's a win across the board. That's 15 people that'll keep playing Eve, keep getting kills like that. See, I'll buy, I buy ships, I buy ships in bulk now, so, you know, I'll go out and I'll buy, you know, like 10 bombers, 20 cruisers at a time, just drop them off at a low sec system, or a, you know, a high sec right on the verge of low sec, and then I'll just slowly chew through my supply of ships, just as I have them, so losing each individual ship doesn't really matter as much once you hit that point, once you get a good stockpile up, and it all just becomes about more of what content you can generate, you know, can you get some good fights and can you get off the game at the end of the night feeling, okay, you know, I had some good fights. I had some good times tonight. You know, I feel like my time was well spent. I'm a dude with, you know, a wife and three kids. My time is very hard to come by. So when I get off the game, I want to feel like I have content rather than, you know, oh, you know, I saved Isk by not engaging that fight. But over the course of the time I play Eve, I'm only going to get X amount of fights. Like, there's a number there. I may not know what that number is, but... but over the course of the time I play Eve, there will be X amount of fights, and I just need to uh, be willing to take as many of those fights as possible if I want to enjoy the game. And as simple as that. So it becomes less about his and more about what you can do with it. Some of the richest people I know just sit in Jitta and never use their risk. What's the point of having it at that point? I mean, I came back. I came back after five years, and due to the whole scarcity thing. I had billions upon billions of like extra network lock worth locked in asset safety, you know, dozens of ships that were only worth, you know, a couple mil, but were now worth hundreds of millions, you know? So a lot of what I've been living off of and funding my little girl mill ex escapades here is just those assets that, you know, they appreciated through scarcity. You know, CCP decided I was coming back to be a hundred billionaire, you know? Not much I can do about that, but then lose some ships and give away free ships to people I like. Would you recommend new bros go to Nullsec early on or wait? I think there's a lot of players that I transition straight to Null that actually make a good uh, run of it. But it depends on the kind of player you are. There's players that you can drop them in Null completely cold. They'll figure out where the nearest market hubs are. The They'll get themselves set up, and it is the best environment for them. There's other players where you drop them in null, they get lost, they lose their will to play the game, and they're gone. So you're either one of the two. Either you can survive in null hot, and it's probably the best thing for you because you're going to get bored in high sec, or it's the worst thing for you. So I encourage everybody to try it, but keep in mind, you know, hey, maybe this isn't going to work out for me. I need to go back to low sec or you know, high sec, and I need to recalibrate. And that's the thing about EVE. You can always recalibrate. I could pick up all my stuff and move to the other side of the EVE universe. I'd do that for a month if I wanted to. No person that could stop me. Let's talk carriers. The carriers are sick. I love them. I just wish they were cost effective. And I'm over... Like, this thing, if I lose, is probably four to five billion-esque. Just ends up not being worth a while. It puts out close to 3,000 DPS. 
which seems like a lot, but when you consider that's four billion, I could buy, you know, quite a few battle cruisers and output well over three K DPS for the exact same price point, or you know, two marauders for the exact same price point. Yeah, so this is the uh, mining op. So this is the second. This is the second hardest site in the uh, faction warfare space. Basically, we're just we're clearing off the rats to let the NPCs keep the uh, Rorqual trapped until the Rorqual pays a ransom in LP. So you get three sets of fighters for these. Uh, right now, I have Dragonfly twos in. Uh, when you're using them, they actually split off as if they were kind of like a separate weapon system, and you can independently target their weapons. You can use their abilities. They've got uh, blaster cannons. They've got a heavy rocket salvo. They've got micro warp drives. The innovation on it, the way it's set up, is really, really cool. I really like how it's set up. I like controlling the drones. But again, we come back to the use case first. The first, the price point on them, and the price point just doesn't seem to be doesn't seem to be there. You know, for six billion esque, you need a little bit more than something that's going to be easily killed but has cool drone mechanics. This I might do more often if this doesn't die right here. Is it? I, I definitely enjoy running these in the uh, in the carrier. Worst case scenario, it's content. So the carrier is similar to how a dread or a uh, marauder works. Has what's known as a network center array or a sensor array, and it can't warp while that's active. Um, but it allows you to lock targets extremely caps. So I can pretty much insta lock uh, battleships. Cruisers take like two seconds to lock. I can lock frigates. And three, um, allowing really potent damage application if I already have my uh, fighters out. Well, it's like there's two different aspects to it. We definitely have people that only fight in frigates all the time, and that's you know that's their favorite thing to do. That's what they want to do. They want to fight in the frigates, and there's all these people that will not go in anything larger than a frigate. But then you also have people like myself, Merc, and a few others who will just bring out our blingy stuff, Niobe. We'll bring out our blingy stuff just for fun, because when else are you going to get a chance to use it, you know? At least here, we have a risk of snuffed, but most likely we're going to face a 10 to 15 man gang. So, yeah, we're probably still going to lose our ship, but at least we're going to get a good fight out of it. And when you're making, you know, I mean, since you've been with me, I've probably made three to 400 millis in LP, and we've only ran like three flexes. So, when you're making that good of ISK, why not? Have you participated in any large fleet activity? When it comes to large fleet conflicts, it really depends. When we were in Usi and doing the campaign down there, um, we had some large engagements with uh, Black Flag and a few other groups. Occasionally we'll get decent engagements with the Calmill and Galmill guys, but it's hard for, they should have put up numbers right now. Um, being the faction that gets cut out of Jitta, that no major, no, there's really no major entities that actually support her mill. Like Angel, Angels has, you know, uh, Goon, several other groups, but there's no real group that fully supports uh, Garistas. But there's no real, no real group that fully supports uh, Garistas, so we end up kind of being outnumbered in most fights. So what I've been doing is I just bought a TS server to set up for people so we have nonpartisan comms. Because we've been bouncing from Discord to Discord, it hasn't really worked too well. Um, so I just set up, you know, nonpartisan comms for all the different groups in Girmill, trying to get them all on a unified comm set. Uh, Uzi was really our first operation where we tried to come together as a militia and actually done. Um, and we had uh, Scary Wormhole people. Uh, oh man, we had a lot of different groups. Black Rabbit, Scary Wormhole people were two of the main ones. Uh, myself and a bunch of just basically a spattering of the uh, Corinthian commune and uh, the rest of the Gurmel guys. Just anybody who could fill in the fleets. We don't usually only get about 15 people, but we were actually able to accomplish most of our goals with those 15 people. So, what is special to you about New Eden? And that that is it. The intrigue, the drama, the politics. You can learn a lot from this game that you can't learn from any other game, and I think that's probably the most valuable thing to it. It's not just that, but it's the human interactions because it's such an open game. You get such unique interactions with people on EVE. I had, at one point, my entire corp robbed me blind because they thought I was trash talking them behind closed doors, right? Robbed me blind, hacked into my account, just took everything. 
thing. You know, I was in the process of getting them banned, and I was like, look, guys, I'll give you one more chance before I, you know, ask CCP to ban you, whatever. But I just have my stuff back. I, as if you thought I was being rude or anything, that's not my... But long story short, they gave me every single thing back, plus a couple bill extra, apologized for it, and they have been the most loyal people to fly with ever since that moment. All because I was like, look, dude, I'm not even mad at you. You guys are my friends. I can't be mad at you. And I just have my stuff back. And because I was willing to kind of humble myself a little, they were loyal to me from that moment forward. And we've, we've done some crazy stuff. This game is giving me experiences that no other game would give you. No other game I could take 15 people and lead them on a can campaign. We were part of the original uh, Brave Take and Catch. And... I took 15 people, you know, we were running around in our dreads, just dropping like 10 dreads on things, dodging PL drops. I'm not getting that in other games. I'm, I'm not getting that level of openness to be able to just to decide to make one of the biggest entities in the game mad and actually pull it off. Eve's something special, so it needs to be protected. Specialness that is Eve is the fact that the players do have such an impact on it, and the developers actually have to have some counterweight from the uh, from the players. You know, they have to listen to the players. It's not like an EA Sports where they can ignore the players and know they're still going to sell copies next year. They don't listen to the players. The whole game goes under because the game is the players. The game is about the players, and CCP understands that better than any other company I've ever seen run a video game. I mean. Look at the longevity of this game and the fact that there's so many of us that still play it as our primary game. I put Eve down for five years. I'm back in it now like I never left. Not many games can pull you in, you know, five years after the fact. There's not many games that have the longevity to pull you in five years after the fact. Eve, every time I log in, the politics are different. The mm -hmm. landscape is different. The environment's different. But it's all still the same in its own way. And like it feels comfortable. It's easy to get readapted back into. And I adore the politics and the people that play Eve. The people that play Eve are like no other people I've ever met. You've got some, some funky ones for sure. But for the most part, the people that I see play Eve are well smarter than the average person I meet you know, out on the streets. Like... There's a different level of complexity to them that comes with playing this game for the most part. There's just a certain style of the E players, and I just adore it in people. And I have found, I'll be honest, this game and the people in this game have saved my life more than once. When I was at Brock Bottom, it's these people, it's my E people that pulled through for me. They're the ones that pulled me out of a pit. Like, literally drove hundreds of miles to, to get my butt set right. They've said, like, the reason I'm playing today is because my Eve people thought the game was better with me playing and bought me a computer on the condition that I would play Eve again. But they knew how much I loved Eve. They knew I didn't have a computer, and that's why I wasn't playing Eve. And they bought me a whole computer just so I could play Eve. That, for me, that is, that is, that's invaluable, man. There, there's no, there's no putting a price tag on this computer. Like, people missed my presence so much that they put hundreds of dollars a product and bought it for me when they only know me online. They put that money into it. They sent it to me, everything. And it's ridiculous to me how close you can make a connection with people in this game. You can make some really good friends for life in this game. There's just something about it. Are there any cool landmarks nearby? You want to see a Titan wreck real quick? They got a Titan wreck like two jumps out. Yeah, this is a uh, leftover from an old uh, pain. Um, they did a scavenger hunt. And this was one of the uh, things in the scavenger hunt. You can still entosis it, it to this day to get uh, radioactive materials to make black lace implants. So it's a source of income for, a, for some players too, the ones that know about it. It's one of those little Eve secrets that hardly anybody knows about. Kind of like a fringe case. It's actually one of the ways I made my first few billion after coming back to Eve. I watched a YouTube video from like 2012 where he explained you know, the scavenger hunt as it was live. And after that, I was like, I wonder if these things still work. Went out, checked them out, and you know, you still make the implants off and you still get the blueprints for them. And I realized those blueprints were selling for 45, 50 mil a piece. Printed my, printed my 
itself off like 10, 15 billion worth of uh, assets. And it only took me, you know, a couple painstaking, annoying days, but that was mostly working at the time anyway. So I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed learning. Yeah. I always worked in here and toasting a structure for 15 minutes at a time, but it definitely, it was definitely worth the money. And there's so many little things like that. So many little plexes, little, you know, in system pieces of lore that are so obscure that most people would never realize are there unless you warp to it and, you know, you actually investigate what it is. I love about this game. I love how much, like, lore has built from the fact that a lot of it's persistent. They don't do what a lot of games do where they just kind of blank say it after. Like, the event happens and the events of the event tend to stay uh, on the system afterwards which is something that most games don't dare do because it just adds an inherent level instantly to the whole process. Like, I've taken lore dives on EVE and just got completely lost. There's dig into once you realize it. Just so, like, a lot of it's not just shoved into your face. Like, you have to get invested. You have to start looking things up in order to truly understand it. But once you do and you start seeing all the little interconnected events, like, this, this happened in 2019 in the Ragnarok is still sitting here you know and it's just crazy and it's full unless they were around in 2019 just don't know about and there's dozens of things like that little hidden ways that people use to make isk there's certain complexes in some of the null zones that i know about that you have to farm a certain site to get a certain key a certain site to let you in you know an extremely rare blueprint or item that'll you know be worth pretty penny and knowledge like that is hidden so much in this game there's so many little secret areas kind of like this is where you can just make a ton of isk if you just know the secret to it. can't remember the one that there was down in Ketch. There was one site in Ketch that was a special name site. And we spent forever trying to crack it. It was for a certain implant. But once we got through it, it was making us billions of isk. It was ridiculous. 